Hey, good evening, everyone. Let's get this thing going. Uh, announcements. We have, I don't know the date. The 8th, March. Oh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, okay, March 18th is 40 and over at 6 o'clock right here. It says 40 and over, but everybody's welcome. Um, what's going on the, here? April 8th? We need candy donations, no chocolates, individually wrapped candies. Anything else? Do what? Okay. If you just want to donate money or candy or whatever, you can bring it in, just get it done. All right. Um, I don't know of anything else, but uh, you want me to open it in prayer? Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Father, Lord, we just want to let you know that we love you. You know our hearts. You know us, Lord. Lord, we ask tonight that you just anoint the lips of Brandon and let, him, let you speak through him. Let your spirit speak through him, Lord. Lord, we thank you for uh, the lessons that are going out here. We thank you for the things that are happening in this ministry. And we ask that uh, you continue pouring your spirit out on us. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all things. Yes, sir. It's a good word that went out this morning. Um. Our pastors are, they was asked um, by another ministry to come speak tonight, so if you're wondering where they're at, that's where they are, and so it's pretty awesome um, to get that invitation, so um, I'm just proud of this body and the direction in which it is moving, and um, praise and worship has been amazing whenever we gather together, and uh, you know, just uh, this body just being unified and operating in such a loving manner. It's just a beautiful thing to be a part of, and so I say thank you to all of you, because you guys are the ones that make that happen. Um, I keep telling you guys every week, like, one step at a time, right? Um, I'm going to say, if you're not reading in the Gospels, open up the book. I asked everyone to read the Gospels before the end of March. This is something that a big group of people um, have... Uh, taking the time to do, and it's just beautiful. I just love hearing the testimonies and hearing the revelation that's coming. Um, here in, a, in the near future, we'll understand why um, we're going through this and the importance of it, but <coughs> as you read it, um, just getting that word inside of you, what we've been talking about is uh, learning to live life from the cross, okay? On the other side of it, rather than returning back to it, there is, a, I've got like this, I'm not going to say it's a vision, but like this just thought of excitement. And in that, one of the things is, I want you guys to, if you got uh, a clock, look at what time it is right now. What time? 5.03, right? And so we've already opened up with some announcements and with prayer, and it's, it's three minutes after five, right? And look at everybody that's here. And in this excitement that I have, it's pretty cool because it's like instead of thinking about, do I go to church, do I not go to church, all that, people are coming to church to get a seat, to not have to stand. I have an excitement for that. I see that. Does that make sense? And so it's not a matter of, man, i got to be on time. Everybody's going to know if I'm late. It, it, it completely flips the script on even the ideology of assembling together to this expectation that develops inside of the heart, okay, of wanting to be there. It's not a question of whether you're going to be present or not. It's a question of where are you going to stand. Does that make sense? Like there's just this excitement inside of me. I see this. Um, when it's coming, I don't know. But there's going to be a time whenever that's the case. And it's kind of cool that uh, a lot of times – um, 
you know, we're rolling five, ten minutes after because people are still pulling up in the parking lot, you know, and we're just trying to wait before we kick this thing off. So um, it says a lot about your walk, if you will. Um, but that's enough on that. Um, as, as we're pressing into this thing and having truth being revealed, over the past couple weeks we've been talking about who we are as children of God. We talked about a little bit about identity. Um, we're going to go over a few scriptures that we covered out of 1 John from last week tonight and hopefully expand on this a little bit. But whenever it comes to grabbing a hold of the word, you have to have a knowing. You have to have a knowing inside of your heart of who you are, okay? Like, in order to operate as a kingdom-minded child, you have to know what is available to you. You just do. And religion does not want that. Religion is a way to hinder, okay, um, if you will, in the sense of routine, hinder the power of God active in the assembling, in the corporate worship, in the gathering together, okay? And so before we take off into some of this new scripture that we've got here, flip over to 1 John. I've got so much stuff, I'm just like, Lord, I don't know where you want to start, end, go to, so we're just taking it one day at a time, right? I don't even know where I'm supposed to be at, so. First John, I, said, I don't know if I told you or not, but First John 4. Yeah, I think I might have said 3 by accident. Oh, okay. First John 4. <coughs> We're going to start with verse 9. We went over st- these scriptures last week. I'll wait till the pages quit flipping. Remember we talked about at the beginning of this how to be able to tell the spirit that is of God or the spirit of error, right? Um, Understanding that there has to be an established understanding in the heart, okay, outside of these walls, in the heart, like in you as a being, all right? When you take time and press in and spend time with the Lord in your quiet time, in your secret place, okay, meaning not doing this just to be heard, not doing this just to be seen, not doing this for merit for man, but truly taking time, pressing in to getting to know who God is, that um, you are present before him. Does that make sense? said last week a lot, and I'm probably going to say this for weeks on, you know it here, but is it known here? Um, That's good. My end up somewhere else tonight. Uh, Verse 9, it says, In this the love of God was manifest towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. I shared last week what that word live is. Most people have heard of Zoe life, okay? This is Zoe life is the noun. This one here is Zahu, if that's even being said right. It's the verb of Zoe life, okay? It is a verb, the action side, the application, all right? Everybody follow me there, that you might live. A child of God, whenever they have accepted Christ and his works on that cross, understanding and knowing what he done, that he wiped out, that he overcame, that he fulfilled, all right? On that cross, in that tomb, in the pits of hell, and resurrecting again, okay, coming back through this that he has fulfilled and he has made you able. That's just the short terms of the way to, the way to put it. He has fulfilled the prophecies, fulfilled the works. He has paid the price, all right? And what he has done in his resurrection has made you able to operate because he has settled the accounts with the wrath of God. Does everybody get that? We're going to read some scriptures here in a minute that go and confirm that again. But to for you to start living through him, he's made this available for you to be able to live, not to be beat down. Yes, you're going to face things. Yes, there's trials. 
I'm not trying to just have rose-colored glasses here. What I'm trying to get you to understand is how you are victorious in these things. Does that make sense? That what your situation is, your present situation, what you're facing does not determine the outcome. Your heart will determine that. Your heart will determine how these things look as you're going through them and what it's going to be like on the other side of it. If you're done wrong, your heart will determine whether you are going to operate in a place of unforgiveness and sickness and pain and suffering or if you are going to operate in a place of, I don't know if I said unforgiveness, but that's what I meant, or in a place of forgiveness to where you are set free from the things where somebody has done you wrong and you learn to be able to share that same love that God shared with you whenever you was his enemy. And then there's a beautiful outcome because you're no longer dwelling on things that were of yesterday. And through that continual operation, slowly turning yourself over into a state of depression because you are renewing your mind in the word in life, being built up in the truth, and these things no longer have a hold on you. Does that make sense? And so learning to live, all right, the action side of that, we actually have to apply this for it to manifest, for it to be seen. You know it here, but is it here? Okay. I'm going to read on. It says, in this, lo- in, the- in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and has sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He settled the accounts, took care of that wrath, the wrath of God, because justice continues to cry out. The short story that I shared about the king and his mother, right? Jesus took care of this. His blood shed, his sacrifice was enough right it goes on it says beloved if God is if God so loved us we also ought to love one another that's one of the things that we I love about this ministry is is how they will love you no one has seen no one has seen God at any time if we love one another God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit it is the seal and the guarantee according to Ephesians 1 his spirit is your, your seal and your guarantee. It says, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. You cannot confess this with your heart if you don't know him. Does that make sense? You can confess it with your lips. But confessing this, truly confessing this with your heart is because you know it. Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks, okay? It says, and we have known, and we have known and believed that the love that God has for us, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this. We're going to expand on this one. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, if Christ is no longer hanging on the cross, right? That's the place of death and defeat. Then you're no longer allowed to operate in a place of death and defeat. Does that make sense? Oftentimes, that's where a Christian lives. Is in a mindset of death and and defeat. The cross is a place of death and defeat, all right? Things were overcame. The devil thought he was taking God out whenever he was just helping fulfill the scriptures and the promise for us in this sense as he gave up his life, okay? And so just as he is reigning from the third heaven at the right hand of the Father, so are we in this world. I hope that throughout the week, these scriptures right here just burn a hole in your heart. (laughs) I really do. Because these things change the course and the patterns of, of operation. They do. It's no longer just the same old, same old, you know, going through the motions. There's purpose behind every single day that you wake up. Just like Victoria talked about this morning, that hope. You have hope as soon as your eyes open. 
just as he is, not as he will be, not as he was, just as he is, so are we in this world. Here's the thing. You might have a hard time grabbing a hold of some of these truths, okay? Think about it like this. If you choose to believe that the sun will not rise in the morning, is it going to keep it from rising? No. It's what we call a spiritual law. It's in motion. God set these things in motion, right? Before he gave man the authority over all of his creation. This is spiritual law. These are things that are going to happen. Well, prior to creation, God also predestined you and his son, Ephesians 1 again. Does that make sense? This was predestined. Just because you choose to believe or to operate in a place less than where you are setting doesn't change the fact that you have the authority and God has given you the right to do so. Some people will say that you can't, you can't operate in that mindset. I challenge that with renewing your mind with the Word. Reading what the Word, the Word tells us that He gave you the authority, He gave you the right to be His child in Christ. Whether you choose to believe it or not has absolutely no bearing on whether it's truth or not. You want to understand why some people have this connection with the Lord? Like, I've heard people say, man, that person just got like a, a, a line just directly to the throne of God. They do. You can have that as well. It takes dedication, discipline. You're going to surrender. But it's available, and you learn to live life abundantly. Does that make sense? And it goes on, and I want you guys to, to see this. I don't know if I got to go into this a whole bunch last week or not, but in verse 18 it says, there is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. Now, this, isn't, this is not just talking about, say, you loved, and say you was hurt. Say it was a relationship and you was hurt. And now, because of that hurt, you fear to love again. That message preaches okay, but let's keep with what it's saying here. God can, he can restore that, okay, I'm just saying. But he's talking about, he's not switching from this love that his unconditional love that he has for us and switching over to talking about a love that you share intimately with another whenever you're, you're, you're giving their, your heart to them. He's saying that there is no fear in love right after he's saying that love has been perfected among us in this. That we have confidence in the day of judgment. That just as he is, we also are in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Whenever God's love is being perfected in you or has been perfected in you, the ugly face of the enemy, the trials, the tribulations, the, the things that the cares of the world, the stuff that tries to rise up and exalt itself against God knowledge, you are not wavered. You release the word over top of these things. Does that make sense? You understand. You see it. You're not just going around loose lipply just throwing the word out. You understand and you see it, not denying what is able or capable in this world, but you're opposing it with a greater truth. Everybody got that? Because what the enemy wants, he wants fear to overcome you in whatever the situation is because it will paralyze you. It keeps you from acting. It keeps you from living, doesn't it? And he's saying that whenever his love is perfected, there is no fear in it. You are free to operate, to live, live abundantly. To me, it is so beautiful. He says, perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Think about that. Here's a way that I, I can maybe share this. The Word tells us multiple times we have been seated in the high heavenly places with Him, okay? This tells us just as He is, as He is right now, as He exists, as He is right now, in the now, all right, you are to be in this world. That's how you are. 
present before him. If the church understood, and whenever I say that, I'm talking about it as a whole, if it truly understood what was available through Christ, it would, it would understand this. We, we started all this off with the tabernacle and the veil and the Holy of Holies. If the church understood, truly understood what Jesus done and where we are placed, they would be mind blown in the understanding that the priest had to come in with the blood and if he did, had undealt with sin as he walked in there, he was dead. Because the presence of God and the Spirit of God instantly judges sin. But because of what Christ has done, whenever you have accepted Him as Lord, as Savior, He has given you a new heart. He has given you a new mind. You have become a new creation in an instant. And His Spirit is fused to your spirit. He has put his mark and his seal on you by way of his spirit. A lot of times you sit there and you look at your failures and you walk in condemnation. You're like, man, I don't know how I'm ever going to live up to this. It's because there's a lack of understanding of what was made available. That is no longer who you are, plain and simple, or you would be dead at the moment of accepting him. Does that make sense? His spirit the same presence that was in the Holy of Holies on the other side of that veil now lives and abides in you. And you reign from the right hand of the Father through Jesus Christ, through your brother. You follow me. I have a feeling we're going to be here for a little while, so we need to get a hold of this. If you're hearing it, pray this week and ask the Lord for revelation on this. Ask Him to open up your heart, open up your eyes, open up your understanding to this. To truly grab a hold of the power that is available with understanding that you are a king's kid, that you are a child of His. That this, this isn't just words to make you feel good and to sound good. This is your inheritance now. Flip over to, I don't know, where are we going, Lord? Flip over to 2 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> I don't know, we'll just start uh, around 13. We'll read a couple of scriptures. <clears throat> we'll start at 14. Everybody there? 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. That word compels, um, one, of the, one of the definitions of is grips tightly or holds together. For the love of Christ grips us tightly. It binds us. It holds us. It, it fastens tight. It's like restraint, if you will. Mm -hmm. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Whenever Christ done this, he done it what? Once for all. Does everybody remember that? Once for all. It says, then all died. And he died for all. That those who live should, no, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Whenever I talk with my brother Jim, and we're having conversation, just say about something that we've ran into, you know, throughout the week or whatever, or struggle. When we're talking, I see the God in him overcoming whatever's coming against him. Does that make sense? And in that, I see him being victorious. Probably likewise. 
If it's John and I, whenever John's sharing with me and I'm sharing something we're going through, he reminds me of the Word. Why? Because he's speaking to, to the, my spirit man. He's confirming what the Word says to me. He's not looking, well, you know, if you wouldn't have done X, Y, and Z, you probably wouldn't be in this situation. God doesn't work in reproach, but oftentimes man does. And a lot of times that's why you see the church still powerless going back to the foot of the cross, not learning to even know how to live, but searching and seeking for forgiveness whenever the Word tells us that if you'll just confess your sins, He is quick to forgive. Forgiveness is already available. Forgiveness was already given. It was done at the cross. There's no need to ask for forgiveness. You're asking for something that's already been accomplished. What there's a need for is an understanding and knowledge to be given to his children to grab a hold of the truth, to know that it's already available, and for them to be partakers of it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This word new means superior to what was. You are a new creation. Please don't let these words be common words. It's the word of God. You've heard these things. I know you have. But are they sparking and quickening life within you? That creation comes from 2937 if you're taking note of a divine work. That's 2937, of divine work. And that word comes from 2936 and 2939. Those words mean, I create, which is of God and only comes from Him, and the founder of a city. It's neat. He creates something new. That word, new creation, that we get comes from two words that I create, and it's often applied to a new city, something that never was, now being instituted and made. Does that make sense? You are a new creation, never before existed. But in Him, now you do. Does that make sense? You have to be, otherwise you would have died. You get that? His Spirit would have judged you and you'd have fell over dead. This is what's available to us. And it's so beautiful. It says, all, th- all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation is the process by which God and man are brought together again. Romans 5, it seems like this ministry has been just spinning on the axis of that that chapter. That you now have peace with God. I think it's in verse 2. That you now have peace with God. You have peace with God. Everybody say, I have peace with God. Doesn't that feel good? If you don't believe it, like if it's not like alive inside of there, just keep telling yourself that. It's the word. Keep releasing it. You renew your mind in truth. If you find yourself in a place to where it feels like God is distant, that you failed him, that you're separated from him, man, you got to get into the word to get out of that funk. You have to. You once belonged to the enemy, okay, to the kingdom of this world. Whenever you accepted Jesus, you went from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of heaven. You're an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, all right? There's nothing the enemy can do for your spirit man. So the battle is over your soul, what you will believe, what you choose to believe, how you're going to operate, because he cannot get you back. But he can keep you in a place of torment while you remain. And it tells us over and over and over and over again through the scriptures about the soul. That the battle is over your soul. That's what he wants. 
He wants to keep you powerless. He wants to keep the church powerless because this, this is no threat to him if there's no impact. It's no threat to him if there's no impact inside of here, let alone outside of here. And if it's not impacting, you're probably doing, I'm going to back up how I'm going to say this. If it's not impacting the people that fill up the church, the church houses, it's probably doing more destruction to one another and to themselves than what he could do to any one person at any given time. Knowledge is important. Understanding who we are. So how do we how do we get to this place? I shared before. Oh, there's that ambassador. It even talks about being an ambassador right after that. Let's just read on real quick. It says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You are an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. You are one who has been sent out, who has already been found approved to speak on behalf of the kingdom. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And not only that, but God will honor your word if you are speaking on behalf of the kingdom. Isn't it neat? He supports that word. The things that you say should be lined up with the word of God. Well, moving on. Best way I know how to put this, there's a lot of knowledge in this book. A lot, right? And if it were possible, and I was just to like open this thing up and smack it a few times and all the words fell out on the floor, and I'd have like this big old pile, look like a pile of leaves, right, that you could just stir up. This is all knowledge. It's all knowledge. That's right there. It's just knowledge. It's what it is. But it's useless stacked up like that. Does that make sense? And so you have to get it. And then as you get it, get understanding and see how these things work together, right? And as you get that, you begin to grow. Do you see that? We're called to do this. Because to a lot of people, this right here might as well just be piled up in the floor. That's what they see it as. The Word tells us, and I think Cliff used it this morning, if you lack wisdom, ask. He gives it liberally without reproach. These things have been made available. Lots of Christians suffer from self-afflicted wounds. They won't grab a hold of the word. Does that make sense? Um, let's flip over. Let's see. Where do we want to go, Lord? Flip over to John 17. There's some really good stuff in this chapter. I don't know how much of it we're going to make it through. I really don't want to move too far beyond grabbing an understanding within our heart of where we reign. John 17. Actually, let's just start at 1633. It's the last verse. He says, These things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I want you to see this. Keep your spot, flip over to John 1. A couple weeks ago we we read verse 12 where it says, But as many as received him to them, he gave the right, and that word right, exousia, he gave the authority to what? To become children of God to those who believe in his name. So you have the right to do this, right? And so now we're going to read 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became reality. Became lived. The word manifest, the word of the word of God is the DNA of Christ. The Word became flesh. Flip back. John 16, 33. In these things I have spoken to you that in me, read it like this, that in the Word you may have peace. In Christ, the manifest, you may have peace. In Him, He is one and the same. He is the Word manifest. Does that make sense? In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Many Christians long for peace but do not know the word. That's it. 
pretty cool, isn't it? We need this to live. We need this in order for his love to be perfected in us. We need this in order to be able to understand that there is no fear in love. It has to be established in our being. 17, it says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also, or also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, as you have given the son authority over all flesh, as you have given the word authority over all flesh, what you've been battling with in your flesh, the word has the authority to override those things. It says, you have, been given him, or you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. All right, here it comes. And this is eternal life that you may know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Check this out. That word know is the gathering of knowledge. Is that not cool? That word know comes from 1097. It's come to know or to take in knowledge. And this is eternal life that you may take in knowledge of you, or that we may take in knowledge of you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. This isn't life starting after death in this body. This is eternal life that you live. Or have available to live now. Knowing Him. Coming to a place of knowledge of Him. It says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. I, have manifest, I had manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You have given them to me. And they have kept your what? Your word. <clears throat> now this is in Jesus' prayer. Check out how he words these things. It says, now they have known all the, all the things which you have given me, which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given to me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. <coughs> I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. God is glorified whenever you gain knowledge of his word. When you receive his words, the words that he has given you, whenever you receive those words, God is glorified. It goes way beyond feeding the homeless. It goes way beyond stopping and helping somebody out at the stop sign. Are those things important? Sure, they're important, but it goes beyond that. God is first glorified. This word was given that you can build a true relationship and be one with him. This was given for you. And all of these things that come with it were given to you for each other. Isn't that not beautiful? It says, and all mine that are yours, and yours and yours mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they might be one as we are. We have a call to unity amongst each other. And as easy as that is to understand, just think about it. We have a call to be unified together. Does anybody have any questions concerning that? What does that mean? To be on the same page, to be moving together, to be like-minded, moving together, right? Everybody get that? Seems pretty easy to understand, right? All right. So nobody has no questions. We've established it, okay? We're going to keep reading. It says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world." 
Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We talked about the sanctification process whenever we was talking about the tabernacle. Remember? I need to go, let me hold that thought right there real quick. I'll find it real fast. I say real fast. Fairly fast. Kind of fast. It was, uh, if you're taking notes, don't, you don't have to flip over there. But Hebrews 10, 14, it says, For by one offering, Christ sacrifice for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified that's when i asked you are you perfect are you being sanctified and it says but the holy spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before this is the covenant that i will make with them after those days says the lord i will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. Then he adds, their sin and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. And that's what kind of started us on this journey. And so, over here it says, that they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You are being sanctified by the word of truth. This word is a must for life more abundant. A must. A must have. This is the children's bread. This is what you eat. People got really jacked up whenever they was talking about, or when Jesus was talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. They got really jacked up about this. We could have several week long discussions, you know, and teachings just concerning communion. We ain't going there right now. But this is your daily bread. Eat of it. The word became manifest. It dwelt among them. He's saying, eat my flesh. Eat the word of God. This is your daily bread. I don't know if I said that yet or not, but I'm saying it three times more. <laughs> it says, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will, who will believe in me through their word, through, through the word of the disciples and through the word of those that are spreading that word, that they, may, that they all may be, what? One. As what? You, Father, are in me. That they may be one. Remember I was talking about us being in agreement and being in unity, you know, coming to that place. Understanding that there is a greater truth, that little divisions, these things do not have a place in the body. Check it out. It says in I and you, that they may also be one in us. It's so easy to grab a hold of that understanding of unification inside of this body. But for some reason, because the word of truth is not being preached accurately, people are going in and dividing the word like crazy. But they're not rightly dividing it. It's a big difference. Put that one word in there, and it changes things. Rightly divide the word. Don't just divide it. Rightly divide it. This ministry has a beautiful, beautiful testimony to the things that we've been seeing happening because people have, leadership has made the declaration inside of their heart and amongst one another, I am unified with you. This was a choice that they chose, and they came together and said, we will remain unified. Sure, there's tribulation. Sure, there's things that try to come in. You know what they operate in? They operate in a manner of love to attack these things that try to come in and create division, and they remain unified. Why? Because we're called to. Guess what else we're called to? We just read it. It says, also may be one in us. We're supposed to be one, unified with the Godhead. You, see, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. 
And so just as easy as it is to understand, I choose to become unified with the leadership, right? I choose in my heart to become unified with my Lord. Does that make sense? You might not know where to start after that point. That's okay. At first, you have to start somewhere. And a good place to start is, Father, you have called me through your Son to be unified with you in my mind and in my heart. I don't fully understand it. I don't know what it looks like, but this is a journey that I'm on. And if I find anything in here that's, that's contrary to what's inside of my heart, then fix what's inside of my heart because I want to be standing in your truth. That's what the Word tells me. I have no clue where I was at. <clears throat> okay. It says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. The glory that God gave to Jesus, Jesus gave to us. Does that sound like death? Does that sound like torment? Does that sound like despair? No. Regardless of whether you choose to believe it or not, that's what's available. You're going to suffer things, but how are you going to operate through them? What word is going to be the greater word in your life? The testimony of the world or the testimony of the word? The accuser of the brethren goes before him day and night, right? But we have overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Your testimony has got to line up with the word of God. The word of your testimony through the blood of Jesus. So beautiful. It puts you in a place that you might not fully understand how to get there. That's okay. But one step at a time. Little by little, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept. These things come, it's a process. But during this time, you have to make a choice. Do I want to truly access what's available for me? I don't want to get way out there in left field and be like, you're going to walk into hospitals and every single room that you walk by, you're just going to be laying hands on people and they're going to be walking out of the... I want us to be able to be obedient to the point that if the Lord tells you to go to the hospital and go to a room, that you'll just pray with that person. God's got something for them. <laughs> because his testimony, your testimony, they're unified, and you have something to share. The goodness of God. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. This is something that we should be seeking to be overflowing with. You want to walk in the promises and the precious things that he has? Flip over to Second Peter. I'm going to close with this. I think there's a lot to chew on here that really needs to uh, penetrate inside of our hearts. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Second Peter chapter one verse two. As people are flipping there, um, a lot of new believers, it's like God kind of shows out in their life. They see like the hand of God working. And they've got this 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 faith. And a lot of this stuff's new to them, and they're just blown away at the hand of God working and just seeing it. And then in I hear a lot of people say, you know, it seems like it's a long time, a lot of dry time. And then it's like I see him working again. And, you know, it's like highs and lows and ins and outs. And it, I see his hand and then I feel distant and all of that. As we read down through here, maybe this will help bring some understanding. Because a lot of times people continue to long to be in that place 
with the Spirit working, right? And whenever you get established understanding that you are seated at the right hand of the Father, that the presence of God is where you're present or should be, right? Where you are present should be the presence of God. When you start understanding your place, your identity, who you are, and operating in faith that he has given you to be able to do so because it is not natural to this world, right? You'll start seeing these things more and more. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. See that word knowledge again. This is knowledge. You want knowledge? What you're asking for is word. Lord, I don't have the knowledge of this. Yeah, you do. You just got to find it, right? If you had to take a Phillips screw out, you wouldn't go grab a square head, more than likely a screwdriver, to try to get that Phillips screw out, right? Some people would. Let me change that. If you need to take a straight head screw out, you wouldn't go grab a square bit, you know, to take that straight head screw out, right? You would go get a straight head screwdriver. You have the knowledge for that, right? And so a lot of times people are focused so much on the, the, what the enemy is doing and the, the less and, and, and how to not operate than what they are to operate. And so oftentimes we're trying to use the wrong tools to access something that's inside of our heart. We're, we're not focused on the kingdom, right? We're focused on or the kingdom of heaven. We're focused on the kingdom of this world, and we're letting what the enemy is bringing up and exalting through by way of our, of our mind, we're letting that be louder than the truth of God. It's exalting itself against the knowledge of God. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty for pulling down strongholds. All right, These things exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And here's that word, knowledge again. And so knowledge is pieces of equipment, if you will. It's, it's access. It's, it's pieces of truth. And so it's saying grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge as you grow in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. It says as his divine power, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You see it? As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. How are these things obtainable? Through the knowledge of Him. Through the knowledge of Him. You grow in the knowledge of Him. You are called to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Him. And it's right here before us. But it doesn't, it, it's funny how this mindset really doesn't fit real well in a church. Back up. In most churches, moving on. <clears throat> it says, a knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. All these things are available to you. Everything that is at the disposal of Christ is at your disposal. All things that were the Father's, He gave to Christ, and all things that were given to Christ, Christ has, what? Declared it to you. How? Through His Spirit. And He comes back and He says again, all things that are mine, He will declare to you. This is in John. These things are available. The Holy Spirit will declare them to you. Well, how do I know what He's saying? Just spend time with Him. Learn His voice. Learn His his voice. It says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Exceedingly great. Like, if you're looking for something, right, we'll just say that that is the standard, whatever it is you're looking for. I don't know. Um, say you're looking for a new golf club. I don't know. And not everybody can relate to that, but hopefully you can understand, right? And a new driver, and you, you, you find one, and there's like this standard that you're looking for, right? And somebody comes along, and they give you the, the best 
the brand newest that there is, just, you know, just came out. Nobody's even used one of these on the course yet, and it's guaranteed to, to straighten out your slice or whatever, right? And you're like, well, crap, I was just looking to get a new one. That would be exceeding what your expectations were, right? And so his knowledge brings forth an increase that exceeds these things that Jesus done you are to do and greater. Does that make sense? Through his knowledge by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. You are called to be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature, the new creation, this is the nature in which you belong. You reign from the right hand of God in the third heaven. Is that not beautiful? This is what is available. It says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue to your virtue knowledge. When you first believed and you didn't know any better other than just have faith, this is what he's given me, so I'm going to believe. And you see virtue. You see things manifesting. Add to that virtue, knowledge. Is that not crazy? From the very beginning of your walk, this has been the call that God has called you to. Just as you have accepted Christ, also live. We have to get up and start living beyond the foot of the cross. Because you are resurrected with Him. It's a lot to chew on this week. But I'm going to close with that, and I pray that you guys will take this back, study it out, ask him to open up your heart to see these things as true. Love y'all, have a blessed week, and we will see you Wednesday night.